Vastamai, good evening and welcome to this week's episode of Agenda. I'm Ewan Gorn. On the programme tonight, does government allow local authorities enough money to spend on housing maintenance? Should a 25% cap on expenditure be lifted? We hear from those who think so. The Mayor of Douglas says he's here to stay and worth every penny. And two local authorities express their commitments to addressing climate change. It's been revealed government has forked out 29% of its rental income on maintaining properties in its housing stock, but only permits local authorities to spend around 24 to 25%. The disparity was revealed in a House of Keys written answer provided by Infrastructure Minister Ray Harmer last week. It comes following repeated calls by Douglas Corporation for the cap on maintenance spending to be raised so houses can be kept to a better standard and brought online more quickly. Well, the council's housing chair, Claire Wells, says an extra 4% of rental income would have allowed the council to spend 400000 more on desperately needed upkeep and has described the situation as frustrating. I asked Councillor Wells for her reaction to the disparity between what the DOI spends and what it permits local authorities to spend. I think it's fair to say it's incredibly frustrating. You know, we would have had just over an extra £400,000 in our maintenance budget, which would have gone a long way to helping a lot of people who need the help at the moment. We've got some properties that are in desperate need of some work and we're just physically unable to do it because we just haven't got the money to do it. So, yeah, it's, um, it's frustrating to say the least. And I believe if you look at the uh, reasoning for why the department had a, had to spend a bit more that year, it was due to the number of void properties the department had to get turned around. And that's a situation that you sort of share with the department there. Yes, in the last financial year, we had just over 140 properties returned to our stock, which is quite a big turnover. And a lot of those properties needed an awful lot of money spending on them. Now, we have been concentrating on our void properties so that they're not void for very long. We can get them back on and have people in them as quickly as possible. Our last count, I think we had 10 void properties on the books, which is very good for us. For the department to turn around and say, well, we we had to use some extra money because our properties needed extra work. It's something we've been saying for at least the last three years. And I just think in some ways, I'm glad that they are having to spend extra money because maybe the next time that we come and say we need more money, they'll be a bit more realistic because they're seeing what we're seeing. Our properties are a lot older than the ones that the DOI look after and they need a lot of money. Nine times out of 10, we find that we're spending thousands of pounds on a property. Would we like to make our void properties returned in a better state? Of course we would. They're on the absolute minimum at the moment. You know, so we do electrical checks and safety checks and all the rest of it. But would we like them to be in a better standard? Of course we would. But we just haven't got the money to do it. So would you like to see the cap lifted or changed? How would you like to see things altered to allow you to maintain things to the standard you'd like? So as it is by the council, we've had a strategy that we put forward um, the year before last where we asked for a very minimum of rental increases to be a CPI. And this is just to literally cover our costs because if the rental increase isn't CPI, we still have to pay CPI increases when they come. So it doesn't cover our costs if they don't do that. So that was one of the things. And then we asked for a stepped increase in the allowances up to 30% of our rental income for maintenance. In 2011 and 12, the maintenance budget was 33.33%, which was a lot higher than what we get now. So we would like to see it increased to at least 30%. I think one of the other things which I would really like is that we were just given a certain percentage of the rental income. So for example, if they said, right, here's 50% of your income, do what you need to do with it. And the other 50% goes to capital loans that we repay. The reason I say that is because sometimes we would want to concentrate on voids and we would use extra money to do that. Other times we'd be right, we're focusing on maintenance this year and that's what we're going to focus on. And it's just giving us that flexibility. So at the moment it's cut down between management, maintenance and our um, sheltered community facilities. If it was just put all into one and each authority was given the ability to do whatever they needed with that money I think that would give us a lot more scope to actually help in the areas that we need the help rather than you know arbitrarily saying well you can only spend 25% this year on maintenance we might need a bit more one year a bit less the following year. The department might argue though that the cap allows them to 
at least have some influence on the policy and where you're spending the housing money. I know there have been some people say to me that not, not in your era, maybe previous eras, that there had been a spending moved into maintenance budgets that clearly wasn't for maintenance. I can't really comment on, on how that worked. But what I'll say is that at the end of the day, the properties belong to the authorities. So it's it's Douglas Borough that have bought or built all the properties. They are owned by them. So they should be allowed to use the money in the way they see fit. They've got to look after them and they are accountable. I've spent so much time, you know, as housing chair, talking to people when they've phoned up to say, you know, I need this doing or that doing. I say, well, my hands are tied because we haven't got the money. We can't use any more money because the DOI have restricted us in the way they have. I understand that they are accountable for our loans and that's where the deficiency comes in and I do understand the whole thing but it's finding a balance between giving us the authority to do what we need to do to make the homes livable for people safe and all those things as well as paying back the loans that we have and at the moment I'm not entirely sure that the balance is quite right. Housing Committee Chair of Douglas Council there Claire Wells well, Onken MHK Rob Callister, who's passionate on addressing issues in social housing, says he was shocked to see the disparity. He told me there are clear conflicts in the department. I don't know if I was surprised or shocked when I actually read the written answer yesterday because the DOI, uh, Housing Division, is the regulator of local authority housing and it sets the parameters. And to set local authority a limit of 24.8% but then allow themselves 29%, I'm absolutely shocked by it, if I'm being honest, because those limits restricts local authorities to turn around void properties quicker sometimes, especially during towards the end of a financial year. Now that has crept up to 25% that allowance now for for this year. What do you think is the ideal way of doing this? Do we still have a cap on maintenance allowances for local authorities or do you think that we need to reimagine the whole system? I I think it's all about turning around properties because there is a a waiting list of people who are are low income, um, hardworking families who are desperately looking for social housing and they wait anything up to two or three years and I don't see it's fair that local authorities should be capped on maintenance which then restricts those properties being turned around especially towards the end of a financial year this is about turning properties around and if local authorities can justify to the regulator the department of infrastructure that they need additional funds towards the end of the financial year in order to turn properties around and get low-income people into those properties i don't see a problem with that when the department is forking out to meet the disparity in the cost of providing housing services and the rental income through the deficiency payments, shouldn't it have some controls on spending, even if it's just maintenance caps? Well, I don't know about regulation, but it should definitely have oversight. And that, again, is the department's um, role. They are the regulator, so they should give the oversight. But if we go back, local authorities were receiving up to 33%, only going back to 2011-12. And I would like to see it being pushed back towards that. This is about turning around properties as quickly as possible. And I, you know, I know Onkin does a fantastic job because I know from my own experience as being an Onkin commissioner, when they looked at properties, they renewed kitchens, looked at um, the actual condition of the properties and carried out any works at that particular junction in order to give less hassle for the local authority years down the line because they don't have to go back and change the kitchens. They don't have to go back and change the bathroom because they've taken the opportunity to do all that work before a new tenant goes into the property. And I fully support that approach. I really do. When you've got the regulator, the Department of Infrastructure, also being a housing provider, are you always going to have accusations of hypocrisy? And do we need to then try and separate them, perhaps have a a different housing regulator? I I absolutely, I think the government's role is to be the regulator and not to provide housing. I think I've said that so many times over the last five or six years. The Department of Infrastructure's role is to regulate and to monitor social housing and to invest and it's the government's role to invest in new housing that housing should be given to the nearest local authority and allow them to manage it on behalf of the tenants because they are in the local authority area they have um, a good relationship already built up with the tenants and they are the right people to run housing it's not government's job as far as i'm concerned as far as i can see to be a housing provider a point that's also been raised to me by a local authority housing member is that rents haven't kept up with inflation which has also meant that maintenance has been costly they haven't been getting the rental income in in line with inflation while costs for materials have been going up with cpi rpi do you think 
Rents also need to go up to help local authorities afford maintenance. I think this is a wider discussion because rents are set given the, the circumstances related to the type of person or the family that needs that home. Most of the time, it's low-income families. This is why I'm a massive supporter of means testing. Not just people are means tested in order to be given a house or a home, but then there should be an ongoing mechanism in order to assess people throughout the life of that tenancy. And if it's a case that somebody has to come out and we should encourage them into first-time buyers, I don't have a problem with that. If there's people who are earning um, a significant amount, then they should be encouraged to come back out and go back into the private sector. It's very difficult, and I know it's very political, but I think it's the right approach. We need social housing to be given to the most vulnerable and low-income families. Families. I don't have a problem with the levels set currently for rents. This is a government investing in low-income families, low-income individuals to obtain housing at an affordable level. When we talk about housing issues, do you think there is a need for government to come forward with a new housing policy that addresses all of these? Because it's not just, for example, this cap on maintenance. There are other issues that are regularly raised to do with housing. Does this need addressing with, with a big major new piece of legislation do you think absolutely i think uh, a proper housing policy debate in timwald and with local government is long overdue we had the david tolson report going back to 2012-13 those recommendations were accepted by timwald but nothing further has happened we need a proper debate of how how many local authority housing units we need in the future how they are funded how we assess tenants going into housing how we assess them exiting social housing or if they need housing for life there's a massive debate on this and i would welcome that any time in the next couple of years because it is long long overdue on can mhk rob callister and you can hear more from the housing member for the department of infrastructure julie edge who will be responding to these concerns on mandate tomorrow morning now, the only mayor on the Isle of Man says he'd fight tooth and nail to ensure the role is kept and insists it provides very good value for the people of Douglas. Jonathan Jockin was selected by councillors to continue for a second year in office at a meeting held several weeks ago. He says it's an honour to be invited to carry on for another term and believes he'll have his work cut out to eclipse last year's charitable efforts. Now retired, Mr Jochen worked in the island's postal service for 40 years, has served as a councillor for five and was briefly an MHK for Douglas East. He was first elected to the position of mayor in 2018. Well, I asked him what it meant to serve a second term in office. Well, first of all, I have to say how honoured I am to be asked to do it again. It is indeed a great honour. And uh, the problem I'm going to have to do now is that I have to follow up what I did in this year, which was very uh, exhausting, the work that uh, my wife and I did, the Mayoress, Angela. And uh, I'm going to have to sort of better the work that I did this year. That's that's the only problem. It is very tiring. It is uh, and very demanding. So what kind of work uh, for the uninitiated does does the mayor do? You get involved in a lot of charity. That's the most enjoyable bit about it, really, is the charity work, because um, you meet all these people on the island that nobody knows what work they're doing, and to meet them and see the work they've done, see the money they've raised. Some of them are just little one-man bands, some are big organisations, and you see all the helpers that they have. It is tremendous what people do on this Isle of Man. I, I, I'm amazed at the amount of charity work that's done on the Isle of Man. It is tremendous. And you do some fundraising of your own at different events as well. Hey, we have the Mayor's uh, Charity Fund. Uh, this year we had SAFA, Douglas Rotary Club and the Manx Special Olympics who are coming into the parlour tomorrow night to celebrate their uh, great achievements uh, that they had in um, was it Abu Dhabi, wasn't it? That was Abu it, yeah. Dhabi, yes. And you'll be choosing uh, new charities for the next year. Is that how it works? Or yes, does yes. It carry I, th- on? I think it's appropriate to pick in some of the charities. Mm. Uh, so we'll be thinking about that over the next month or so. And what else does the mayor do? Obviously, you're the public outward face of, of the council in some ways as a ceremonial role, but you also play a role in the chamber in the day-to-day running of the place as well. It's a non-political role, really. It's Sometimes it's a bit annoying sitting in the chair. I'd love to say something, but I, I, you're really just the chairman of the council. Do you think what the mayor does is value for the people of Douglas? Oh, yes, it's a very good value for the people of Douglas. It's... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the mayor, uh, it's not a job as such, it's not a paid job as such, where he does get an allowance mm. uh, for entertaining and um, he gets a small allowance, uh, a monthly allowance, but it certainly wouldn't cover 
most people say probably be minimum wage to be quite honest and for the work I mean today of four events I've got on today so it, it's quite demanding I mean my last one's at half past seven so I was up this morning at nine o'clock out on something and you know it's it's just a continuous all the time really mm. it's uh to get a day off as a luxury. <laughs> so for those who, who might be critical of the position, would you would you always argue for it? Oh, certainly, yes. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, we've got a mayor. We've only got one mayor on the Isle of Man. He is, it is an important role. I mean, they fought hard to get it over 100 years ago. And uh, all these ceremonial uh, roles, I mean, yes, I'd, I'd fight tooth and nail to keep them. Mayor of Douglas, elect and select Jonathan Jockin. You're listening to Agenda on Manx Radio. Russian parish commissioners have chosen to add their support to an environmental lobby calling for drastic climate action from government. The local authority has voted to join the Climate Change Coalition after it was proposed by Chairman David Radcliffe. He told me the climate issue was bigger than just the parish. I think it's such a big issue. It's going to affect everybody, everybody on the planet, really, not just the people of Russian or the Isle of Man. And I think it's important that we get people talking about it just to try and get people to focus on it more. It's been sort of brushed under the carpet for years and years, along with lots of environmental problems. But I think they're all starting to show themselves now what could happen and uh, we really need to do something. So why the coalition? Um, I suppose there's lots of ways you could have decided to to do something. Why join uh, the Climate Change Coalition? I think it, the more momentum that, that something like this gets behind it, the, the better, you know, the more organisations that join it, the more seriously it would be taken. People would take more notice of what's going on and what, what could be done, what yeah. needs to be done. I mean, it'd be easy to say this, uh, the Isle of Man's so small it's not going to make any difference, which is true, but I mean, you could say that about any country, any county, any, any organisation. Some might say Russian parish commissioners, why are they getting involved? They're just a small, smallish local authority. What would you say to that? Well, everybody is part of the, <laughs> the greater community of the, of the island and, and the planet, and uh, people need to get engaged with this. You know, we're representing the people of Russian, yes, but uh, we're all in this together, really. Russian has been undertaking a number of initiatives as well which are linked in, I suppose, to this. Could you just uh, jog our memory? What have the uh, commissioners been looking at? I suppose the most obvious thing we've been doing, it's, it's it's a gradual process. It's been going on all over the island, really. When we need to replace street lights, putting in LED lights to replace the older type. I mean, that's not just rushing. Everybody's been doing that. And that's, that's one thing. Something else that I suggest at the end of last year, that uh, as a means of mitigating climate change in some small way, we, we could look at doing some tree planting schemes within the parish. Russian's a rural parish, as you know, so there's plenty of land, there's plenty of underused land. So we've, we've approached the uh, forestry department with a view to carrying out a, a tree planting scheme on the road to Slock. So we're hoping to get that started next winter, really. Chairman of Russian Parish Commissioners David Radcliffe. Well, in the same vein as Russian, though a slightly different tack, the chairman of another local authority, which announced a climate change emergency last month, says national politicians can't keep kicking the issue down the line. Andrew Jessup hopes Braddon Commissioner's declaration will build awareness and a groundswell of public opinion to influence government to take that urgent action. I asked Mr Jessup whether, like Russian, a small entity like Braddon Commissioners could make a difference. If nobody sort of takes responsibility for the situation that we're in from an environmental and climate perspective, then nobody is. So as in other countries, and this has been the case, for example, in Australia, because the central government has been dragging its heels over implementing policies and actually rolling out action plans, some of the local authorities said, well, in that case, and we need to drive this from the bottom upwards. So if we declare a climate change emergency, then hopefully, you know, that will start to sort of make a greater awareness, more publicity, etc. And it will sort of grow a sort of groundswell of opinion, which will hopefully will then start to influence our national politicians who realise then that they really have to do something and they can't continue to kick these issues down the road 
into the next body of, of politicians' responsibility. Those politicians would argue they've produced a series of reports, DOI, MUA, DEFA, they've got this consultation ongoing. They'd argue they are moving the issue forward. Yeah, but again, it's all too slow. You know, it's not as though the change in the climate has been unknown about. We're talking 50, 60 years people have been talking about, you know, major shifts in in weather patterns and and climatic conditions. You know, there's been umpteen reports. How many reports do you need before you actually need to start realising this is actually something that needs action now and not just further consultation? This issue about, oh, we're consulting, but we're consulting on things where decisions have already been made on these issues elsewhere, so it's, it's not a case of the people in the Isle of Man are that much different to people across the water who are already being told that, you know, from about 2025, you know, no new gas boilers, oil boilers will be allowed to be fitted in new properties, etc. These are the sort of things that, you know, the Isle of Man government could actually do tomorrow without having any need to actually consult on it. Well, what can the local authority do as a first port of call in terms of your own actions to mitigate some of these issues? Well, at our meeting last week, we called on our officers to start compiling a a report on what we can actually do within the office to actually reduce our climate and stroke uh, carbon footprint. So we're looking at measures to actually reduce water usage, energy usage, etc., heating, whatever. We now just look at doing things smarter, more efficiently. And then we're also going to start looking at drawing up uh, guidelines and policy in terms of our interaction with external bodies and contractors so that in future we will, in our decision making, have to factor in any impacts on the climate, the environment and future generations. Have you asked other local authorities if they'd be willing to sort of join up with you on this and give your uh, your voice a bit more strength in numbers, I suppose? On the same day that we had our uh, Bradley Commissioners Board meeting, there was the uh, March of meeting of the Municipal Association and fortuitously, perhaps, We had as our guest speaker at that meeting, DEFA Minister Mr Boot and his Chief Executive Richard Lowell. So yes, an opportunity arose very soon after our commissioners meeting to actually raise that issue with both the department and also with other local authorities. It was certainly well received by some of the other, well, some of the other authorities. Again, I'm not quite sure how well it it sat with uh, Mr Boot and his Chief Executive. Well, what did they say to you? Were they receptive to the declaration? Well, again, they, they sort of make it out, well, we're in a consultation and, and we're making out that they were, we've been meeting some of the targets that were set in the last round of discussions. And yeah, but basically, as I see it from, from their consultation, no real major change in, in uh, energy use, etc., is going to take place until at least 2035 under the current proposal, you know, which is another 15 odd years away. And that to me, it's just not good enough. You know, when we've previously said that we were going to cut our emissions, etc., by now. As the local authority, is it appropriate for you to be doing this, I suppose? Because it's not necessarily within the, the remit of a local authority to be pressing on these issues. Well, I wouldn't say that that um, it's not within our remit. You know, we're, we're a publicly elected body. You know, we represent local people. And yes, you know, we're, we're well aware of, of the issues that we're facing and therefore it's only right and proper that we take notice of that in any decision we do in terms of you know appointing contractors we can start asking them for their environmental credentials so that we won't necessarily be choosing people on the basis of of what's cheap or who's cheapest but also whether the methods in which they are working are going to actually reduce the impact on uh, the environment and on the climate Mm. because Longer term, a little bit more money now may actually save us an awful lot more money in the future. A lot of these issues are decisions made by previous administrations. Do you think it's fair to criticise overly the people who are in charge today for the decisions that were made some time ago, probably when they weren't around? It may be true that that previous Tinwolds have made some pretty poor decisions in the past. But again, the current uh, politicians can't just keep blaming somebody else they've actually got to leave a a positive legacy themselves and they've got to look at how we can actually mitigate some of the mistakes of the past. And if it in some cases means that we will have to write off misguided investments in the past to actually protect our future, then that's something that we have to do. Certainly, there's lots of evidence that moving to a different way of doing things in the future doesn't necessarily mean fewer jobs, 
less money, etc., and people being restricted on what they can do. It's just they're going to have to look at doing it in a different way. And how do we know the Manx people want this? I mean, I don't recall particularly any strong climate change manifestos. I don't know about the local authorities. Maybe that was different there. But were people voting in politicians to make these changes? And, and I suppose if they weren't, isn't a consultation a good idea to see if people actually want you to crack on with these issues? Well, I think um, the Climate Coalition people have uh, recently brought a few MHKs to task that did make statements in their manifestos in terms of what they wanted to do to try and help the environment. But in terms of a ground root protest, you've only got to look at the recent uh, walkouts by uh, school children. Those are the people that really we ought to be listening to as much as anything. It's their future that we're gambling with at the moment. The chairman of Braddon Commission is Andrew Jessop. Well, Aaron Ibanez asked the DEFA minister, Geoffrey Boot, whether Braddon's rebranding of the situation was helpful. Well, I, I think we have to be careful. I, I, I mean, I'm inclined to agree with the sentiment, but how you brand things uh, is is often sometimes difficult for people. Um, we have an emergency going forward. If you look at the, the figures and the, the CO2 emissions and uh, the climate change predictions, uh, then that is uh, definitely uh, an emergency for the planet. I, I have no problem uh, with different uh, areas, countries, what have you, doing that because I think it just raises the awareness of what needs doing. I'm finding that generally the message seems to be getting out there and uh, our new climate change uh, strategy uh, consultation is part of that process. Not only does it let people know what's happening but what can happen and it's part of an educational process. That's all from tonight's programme. We'll be back with more from Agenda next week and you can listen again to this episode online as a podcast. But for now, Gurumayu and have a good evening.